Hey there, this is Tucker Balch. I'm a managing director at JP Morgan. I just opened my chat window. Uh, let me verify that people can hear me. If you can hear me, please uh, say hello in the chat window. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session. Our next speaker is Tucker Balch. He is from. He is the managing director of J.P. Morgan AI Research. Please join me in welcoming Tucker to the virtual stage. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, as uh, Petrica said, I'm a managing director at uh, J.P. Morgan, and I want to tell you today about uh, our new group, AI Research. I'm going to try and share my screen here. Let me. Turn that on. And uh, just so everybody knows, um, I'm looking at the uh, chat window. So as we go along, if there's a question, uh, I'll try and answer it. But uh, in the meantime, let me uh, just ask people to say, tell me you can hear me <laughs> in the chat window. I want to be sure everything's working there. Okay, I see a yes. I think that means you can hear me. Great. Okay, let's go for it. All right, uh, as I said a moment ago, I'm a managing director at uh, JP Morgan AI Research. We are a new group that's been around for about uh, two years. We started uh, with Manuela Veloso. She was previously the head of the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon and she joined JP Morgan to establish AI research at uh, JP Morgan. Uh, in terms of uh, leadership, there are three of us that uh, work with Manuela closely, uh, myself, Tucker Balch, uh, Dr. Prashant Reddy, and uh, Dr. Samina Shaw. Uh, we all have quite uh, deep experience in AI and research, all, all of us with PhDs. Um, one thing I wanted to tell you is uh, our group is composed of about 35 researchers right now, uh, and we're expecting to grow uh, over the next few years to an even larger number. We, we, no telling uh, how large we're going to grow, but uh, uh, we are um, definitely interested in people with uh, strong backgrounds in AI and, uh, and finance. Our work at JP Morgan AI Research centers on seven uh, key themes. We call them aspirational goals. And these are um, these are things that uh, within which we group the projects that we're working on. And they're goals that we expect that uh, you know may take many, many years to accomplish. And uh, these are these are the the, the seven here. Uh, two that I want to focus on that that I'll be talking about in this presentation is uh, AI to liberate uh, data safely and AI to predict and affect economic systems. We have uh, many, many projects going on within JP Morgan AI Research, and uh, we, we want to be sure each one of them is aligned with one of these uh, aspirational goals. So two particular projects that I'm going to delve into in a little bit more depth are uh, computer vision for time series prediction and the other is simulation of electronic markets. Now, like I said, we have many other projects going on here, but uh, these are these are two that uh, that I work closely with and, and that I think you might find potentially interesting. Okay, so this uh, first project that I'm gonna tell you about concerns computer vision for time series forecasting. And it, it comes from the observation, you know, if you, if you go to the trading floor, of any large investment bank or hedge fund or whatever, you will see traders glued to their screens, looking at the screens and making decisions based on the visual information that they see. So uh, the, the important observation here is that people aren't making decisions 
based on lists of numbers. They're making decisions on the visual information that they see. And the strong success of, you know, recently of deep learning originates in computer vision, and in particular, sort of modeling of the human vision system. And so our thought is, hey, why don't we treat this problem of time series prediction from the point of view of predicting how an image is going to evolve over time instead of just predicting how the particular series of numbers are going to change over time. Uh, and I've got a little example there in the, in the lower right-hand uh, part of the screen where we're showing, okay, we've got some historical set of values uh, in, in, the, in the gray area, and we want to predict what's going to happen to that time series in the future, which I show in red. And you'll see an Im the, this image will sort of repeat itself uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the presentation. So anyways, remember the gray always represents the past, and the red is representing some future that we want to know about. Uh, I do want to acknowledge my colleagues who work with me on this at uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, they're they're in the lower left there, uh, but this uh, this work uh, represents you know at least a year and a half of investigation and research and implementation and testing, and uh, we 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 have filed patents on this. Anyhow, overall, what we want to do, uh, as this diagram shows, is we would like to be able to create some model, uh, input some historical time series into that model and have what comes out predict what's going to happen to that time series in the future. Uh, so this is what we're looking for. And, and again, notice that um, we, uh, we have this red area represents the future that we may, you know, that we don't know about yet, uh, except when, the, when it comes out of the model, we, we see it there um, on the right and the, uh, on the bottom. So this is what we want. Well, how do we, how do we create this model? Well, what we do is uh, we work from historical data. Uh, and in, in this particular case, we used um, uh, daily, in, in the examples you're going to see, we use uh, daily data from S&P 500 stocks uh, over multiple years. And for each stock, of course, we have uh, quite a you know, broad history, but we don't, uh, we don't train the model just on one stock. We, we train it on, on many. And because we have because we can roll back time uh, in this process, we can, in some sense, sort of see the future. So in other words, uh, in this example here, this past image uh, corresponds with this future image. So we turn this time series into images, and then we grab sections of them to, to train our model. So you can see here, we, we grabbed this historical, you know, uh, data leading up to this red area, and that is the input to the model. And then we want to train it to output what's going to happen in the future. So this is the this particular kind of method. It's called an autoencoder. Uh, it's very, uh, very popular in, uh, in, in deep, deep learning. And again, so we, we train it with pairs of images. Here's what the past looked like. Here's what the future looked like. Learn that those two are associated. Now, we don't do it just for you know, one particular pastime, we do it for multiple times over, you know, rolling forward uh, and, and not just for, you know, one particular asset, but for multiple assets. And we're able to get thousands and thousands and thousands of images to train the system on. Um, okay, next. We've been testing this with several different example time series. Of course, uh, financial time series, which um, you know we're probably all interested in uh, at, uh, um, at at this event, but we wanted to try on a few other types of time series uh, to see how the properties of those time series might affect the accuracy and 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 the results. So one kind of time series we started with uh, is our harmonics, in other words, just sums of sine waves. Uh, so uh, in, in this case, we just uh, sum two sine waves. There's, there's multiple parameters like trends, amplitude, frequency, and so on. Uh, and each, each time series that we test with is a sum of, of, of two uh, harmonic series. Now, you would think that um, overall that might be the most easy to predict. And, and indeed, that's, that's what we see in our research. Uh, the next set of data we looked at is EKGs, 
so you know those basically heartbeats over time. Uh, a property of of uh, these time series is they're you know quite um, repetitive, and after we see a few of them, we ought to be able to fairly easy easily predict what's going to happen next. And then finally, of course, we looked at uh, we looked at financial data to see how well we could predict that. Now let's look at what uh, what comes out. Uh, how well does it work? Uh, here you can see examples of the three different uh, types of time series that we looked at. The upper left here is uh, uh, the harmonic series. Upper right is the EKGs. Um, lower center there is um, financial data. Now, for each um, for each example that we're looking at here, uh, there's there's three images, and let me tell you what each one is. So on the very left is ground truth. So that's what happened in history, and then the red area shows you know what happened looking into the future. Uh, the middle is what comes out of that uh, deep neural network uh, autoencoder. Um, so again, the red area is the future that it's predicting. Finally, uh, the rightmost image is a, a probability distribution of where we think that time series is going to land uh, at the end at the very right side of the of the red part of the image. So if you look here at the uh, at this harmonic time series uh, and look at so we call it a PDF probability distribution, um, uh, you can see that this one has two peaks. So the system essentially thinks, well, it it, it can probably go two ways, either either uh, up here towards the top or towards the middle. Uh, if you look at this uh, the example of the EKG, you can see there's a pretty strong peak right in the middle, and so the system is fairly certain that it's going to end, you know, right right at that same value. Uh, and for this example of uh, financial time series, we see a see a single peak. Now, one thing that's really interesting and I think powerful about this technique that I want to mention is that this uh, probability distribution that you uh, see at the end um, isn't bound to be just, you know. Typical um, forecasting methods provide you a expected mean and then some kind of standard deviation. Well, this gives you a, a very complete um, probability distribution over that future time. Let me show you some uh, some additional examples. These are with uh, time series. Um, the the upper left one here I think is especially interesting because uh, you can see that it, uh, it it essentially bifurcates. And so what the system is showing with these two peaks is that it doesn't believe that the price is going to continue just uh, level. Uh, it believes it's either going to go up or it's going to go down with sort of the preponderance of the probability going down. Now, some of these others are more unimodal. The one on the lower left there has a single peak. This one is kind of generally noisy. This one has a single peak. But, uh, you know, getting to the point that the, the real power here is that we can predict multimodal distributions uh, towards the end. Um, what this slide is about is, you know, how do we evaluate how good our prediction is? And our approach is that we compare ground truth, you know, because after the, after the fact we know what it was, uh, with what we forecast, and we take a slice out of each of these images and you can you can think of each slice as being essentially a probability distribution, and we uh, there are various methods for comparing these probability distributions. Uh, I, I think we're using the um, uh, JS divergence. Okay, so that's um, that's it for time series prediction. I'm going to move. Uh, to, to one last topic, which is simulation of electronic markets. Uh, I'll try to end with about five minutes remaining for question. Be glad to um, uh, be glad to answer questions there. Okay, I'm going to take five five more minutes. Okay, uh, one of the things that uh, my group does uh, at J.P. Morgan is we simulate electronic markets. One reason this is important is because. Um, of course, we, you know, most people work with historic data. I think that's important, of course, but we can't. Um, if, if you if you train a model from historic data, it can only learn from examples that have happened in the past. We we can't have sort of hypothetical uh, e examples that that haven't yet happened. Uh, we use a technology called um, 
discrete event simulation, which enables us to uh, repeatedly simulate the same scenario and get exactly the same results. Uh, the only difference being, you know, some uh, some way that you're modifying the experiment. You're, you're you're trying a new algorithm, but the rest of the of the model, the rest of the world is is still the same through each one of those simulations. Uh, another important thing is we can simulate high frequency environments. Uh, so we can uh, we can simulate at nanosecond precision. And in, in case you don't know, there's uh, you know in one trading day there are 23 trillion nanoseconds. So uh, many traditional sort of simulators will simulate each time step. Well, uh, if you if you want to simulate 23 trillion time steps, uh, you won't be able to get that done uh, in a few minutes, which is usually what you need to be able to do. So let me just uh, review uh, uh, a couple things we, we, we do. So, so the, the simulator is called Abides. It's open source. It's available. You can download it and play with it yourself. Um, it, it, it enables two ways of uh, simulating, you know, simulating electronic markets. One is called market replay. In other words, we, we start with level three data where we have uh, every every single order that came into the market, cancellations and so on. And we, we create just a three agent simulation. So one of the agents is an exchange. One of them is the market replay agent that is just firing off these historical orders. Uh, and the last one is this experimental agent that we want to test or evaluate. You know, can it be, can you trade profitably or whatever? Um, uh, and the, the entirety of the rest of the market is made up by this uh, market replay agent that just fires off what happened in history. And then we get logs, uh, you know, that look exactly like NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange logs of what happens in the market. Now, what our approach is, is instead of, uh, so we support this market replay, but what we do additionally is uh, we enable agent-based simulation. In other words, in, instead of having just one agent that's replaying historically what happened, we populate the simulation with thousands of agents. Each one of these agents has its own purpose for acting or doing what it's doing. And the combination of all these agents acting uh, results in a comprehensive uh, ecosystem of agents that are trading against your experimental agent that you're trying to test. An important property of this is that the market responds to what your experimental agent is doing. If you're just doing market replay uh, and you put in trades, the the market is just going to revert to you know whatever it had done before uh, because it's it's not aware of your agent and its interaction. Um, I think I will. Uh, skip over uh, these additional slides so that we can have uh, some more time for uh, questions. Uh, one one thing before I uh, before I close, I, I, I did want to show you this slide. Um, th these are examples of testing a uh, a, um, a TWAP agent, uh, uh, time weighted average price. So in in the um, gray zone that shows a an, our agent that we're evaluating is trading some number of shares every minute uh, during the gray area and <clears throat> the upper left shows uh, one percent of volume of the market the lower right shows uh, 50 percent of, of the market and what you're seeing here with that dark blue line in each one of these examples is what the bid ask midpoint is and what we're seeing here is that the market the, the the higher percentage of the market that our trading agent is is consuming, the more it impacts the price upward. So this is demonstrating that um, our simulated market is responding to the behavior of the agent that we're engaged in. Okay, uh, we've got about uh, five minutes left, so let me uh, wrap this up. If, if you're interested in that simulation, uh, just go to GitHub and search for Abides. And let me stop now and see uh, if we've got any questions. Okay, so I'm looking in the chat area and I do see some questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, Eric asks, for how long a period are you able to predict and what is uh, what is the accuracy? So uh, I assume he's referring to the computer vision uh, system. We, we call that Mondrian, by the way, is our sort of code name. So, uh, 
the, the current evaluations we're doing, uh, we're using daily data as opposed to intraday data. Uh, I think there's, there's a strong interest also in looking at uh, intraday data as well. But uh, to answer your question, we use uh, 80 time periods as the history and 20 time periods as the future. And with regard to the uh, accuracy, we're, we're working now on, on making that evaluation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question. I'm sorry I can't give you a concrete answer right now, but uh, indeed that's, um, that's an important matter that, that we're evaluating right now. Um, okay. Uh, do you use candlestick charts or line charts for training? Uh, good question. We have uh, uh, two versions of this uh, system that we've built. One uses candlestick charts. Uh, the other uses um, uses line charts. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the system works with uh, with with both both types of visual data. The you know the key thing is to treat the data as an image as opposed to treating it as a as a series of numbers. Um, okay, let's see what other questions we got here. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, one of the questions uh, concerns the architecture of the uh, of the deep network. Uh, are we using convolutional neural nets and then autoencoder? So. Uh, Indeed, it um, uh, the our, our initial work is, has been just with straight autoencoders, just uh, uh, take you know pulling the image apart into a um, long series of, of of numbers and and, and building an autoencoder, you know, just an image uh, autoencoder. We are now ex uh, looking at um, convolutional neural nets. We think it's going to work better, uh, but this was just proof of concept with just a straight autoencoder. Okay, look and see if we've got any other questions. All right, um, we've got one minute left. Uh, please post any questions if you got them. One other thing I wanted to tell you about is uh, we're having a scholarly conference, an academic conference. It's not really a competitor to this AI for uh, finance, but uh, October 15 and 16. It was originally going to be in person in New York, uh, but now we've gone uh, completely virtual. But uh, lots and lots of uh, peer-reviewed papers on topics like the one I've been uh, discussing. So please, uh, please consider to um, join that conference, and you can find all you can find all about it at uh, AIfinance.org. Um, okay, uh, I'm just looking to see if we have any more questions. Time series modeling benefits from rich structure, which gives a foundation and prevents spurious model specifications. How do you control for this in deep learning space? Um, I, I think um, maybe you're talking about uh, modeling methods like, um, um, what is it, Amira? Um, and yes, I, I, I think those are very those are very powerful. The the one of the things that we're trying to do is make something that can work from any kind of image. So yeah, we've been looking at uh, time series images, but uh, people make decisions from other types of images also. And by working at the image level, we don't need to know about the structure of, of the time series that we're looking at. Uh, the system can learn those properties itself without us having to explicitly build it into the model. Um, okay. Oh, I was given extra time. So, uh, I think, is that right? <laughs> uh, it looks like I've got uh, four extra minutes. So please ask any questions. If you have them, I'll be glad, glad to answer. Okay. I'm looking uh, through some of the questions here. Uh, reinforcement learning should be promising for agent-based modeling. Any work there? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, in, in fact, uh, in uh, another group at J.P. Morgan is investigating 
uh, using reinforcement learning for trade execution. So in other words, if um, uh, someone comes to JP Morgan and says, I want to sell 100,000 shares of Apple, um, we don't want to just put in a single giant order into the market. We want to slice it up into lots of little bits and execute uh, each of those uh, small transactions one at a time. Um, and we're using uh, reinforcement learning to learn how to how to do that. Now that research is not uh, within my group, but we're collaborating with those folks, um, in fact, to test the algorithms they've got within that uh, simulation that I had mentioned. But uh, yes, absolutely, reinforcement learning is an important uh, method for uh, looking at uh, trade execution. How have your models fared in recent markets? Uh, Good question. The, the the ones I had just shown you um, are very much prototypes, and we're beginning the evaluation phase right now. I'm just so excited. I wanted to show you what we have. <laughs> but uh, we have a very strong uh, research group at J.P. Morgan, and we're going to work with them to validate, uh, you know, these probabilistic uh, predictions, and uh, and see how well they 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 do. Uh, let's see if we've got any other question. Looking at some other questions here. Uh, Santiago asks, hello, thanks for the insightful presentation, of course. Uh, do you see any potential in applying deep learning for time series analysis, um, e.g. training of automated portfolio managers via reinforcement learning on historical data? Um, I, I, I think that's a fair question. Um, and, you know, of course, we're now, lots of people are looking at ways to combine deep learning with reinforcement learning, and those are those are quite uh, successful. And in fact, you're, you, you may or may not be familiar with them. Um, uh, people have investigated using uh, deep reinforcement learning, you know, which is the combination of deep learning and reinforcement learning, uh, to play video games. Uh, so a, a, a really important paper, I think came out about four years ago, uh, showed where they use the the input, you know, the, the input to the system is the visual you see uh, when playing a video game, and the output of the system are the decisions you would make on a, on a controller. Uh, and for sort of 80 out of 100, uh, I think they used old Atari games, 80 out of 100, their learning system was able to perform better uh, than a human. Uh, there were uh, about, I'm, I'm just guessing, I think 20 games that they were not able to do as well as a human. And the difference is that those um, 20 games required uh, strategy or longer term planning. Uh, they, they weren't just sort of immediate reaction sorts of games. Uh, anyways, getting back to the question, uh, using this in finance, uh, yes, I think, I think uh, the area is ripe for use of these methods in finance as well. Okay, it looks like I'm out of time. Thank you very much.